Hey guys, we're going to go through this PowerPoint together. Um, feel free to pause the video to read the slides. It is a good idea to read everything that's on there and make sure you get all the information. Um, this is about composition, which is a major part of photography. Without composition, you're just taking snapshots. Composition is the plan, placement, or arrangement of the elements or subjects in a work of art. The general goal is to select and place appropriate elements within the work in order to communicate ideas and feelings with the viewer. It is the primary element in photography and an important concern in many forms of art, like film. This isn't something completely new. We've talked about composition before. Any technology student will benefit from better understanding of composition. Um, learning how to, to move things inside the frame and why things should be where they are and the emotional reaction people will give to that placement is part of being a film person or a photographer. Note that the general goal is to select and place appropriate elements within a work of art in order to communicate ideas and feelings. We're going to start with the rule of thirds. And we've talked about the rule of thirds before. Um, it's the intersecting lines and the placement of a subject within those lines. So feel free to pause this if you need to to read through that, but I'm not going to read it all to you. Um, we're going to just look at some examples. Here we have a picture that's clearly in a portrait mode instead of landscape. And in the rule of thirds, it states that an image can be divided into nine equal parts by two equally spaced horizontal lines. And then um, two vertical lines equally spaced. Where the lines intersect, that's generally the best point of interest for your picture. Um, people who agree with this technique generally um, think you should align them with the intersecting points, but just being close to the line and out of the center is generally a good enough technique, um, making the picture a little more interesting and a little more um, appealing to the, the viewer. We'll get some other pictures who are following the rule of thirds. Here our subject is right at that point on the left corner. Notice that he's looking to the right, allowing a lead room for the viewer. We can see what he's looking at. Imagine how different this photo would look if he was on the right side, still looking to the right. You wouldn't know what he was doing. You would just have a picture of a child, which could still be interesting, but we wouldn't exactly know what he was engrossed in or what he was staring at. Here's another picture. Note, this picture is a little wider and our, our lines are different, but he's still closer to the right side. He might be a little too far over, but there's so much interest going on with what he's looking at that it might work out pretty well. All right, let's go to simplification. Whenever you have a lot of clutter in an image, it can be distracting to the, the viewer. So keeping it simple is always a, a great idea. I mean, let's be honest, it's a simple idea. Um, not having something so busy that it distracts from the point of the picture or the subject. So, simplification is easy enough. Decrease all the extra stuff as much as you can. There's different ways you can do this. Here, the, the setting, the way our angle of the camera, we're looking down and we can only see the surrounding content. The shovel that's in the picture is actually adds to the element, letting us know that he's clearly enjoying a game, not being punished. But notice on this picture, what we did to get rid of the background is we filled the frame with our focal point. We wanted the subject's face to be the focus, so we zoomed in. We cut out the extra information by cropping our image just right so that we only see what we want to see. Same thing with this picture. We're in there. We're zoomed in. Look at that nose. That's a cute nose. And here's another picture. Same kid. He looks happy. Again, we're not seeing the background. We don't need to. It's irrelevant to the photo. And that's what it means by extraneous. We don't need to see the extra stuff. We just need to see the subject. That's what the photo is about. Who cares what the room looks like? We want to see the subject. Here we have a brochure, a flyer. Simple. Look at all that negative space. No background whatsoever. The focal point is the subject. It's um, my mom's superhero. It's a little uh, essay where we cut the head off of one picture and put it on a superhero body. The focal point is there. Another way you can simplify things is by framing your subject in. Notice how the slide here, the tube slide, works to frame our subject in. He is centered, so we're not following the rule of thirds in this picture, but it's still a nice element in the image. We're going to see framing on a couple of other pictures.
Notice here, framed in with the window or the door, it looks like of a playhouse. This one, using the chair that she's leaning over to look at the camera to frame the bottom portion of the picture. It's a really interesting way to fill in the space um, and make sure the subject is our focal point and not the background. Also note that the focus here is clearly on the, the subject and not on the background. While the background's still clear, it's hazy, uh, partly from the smoke but partly from the focus of our lens. And here, what better thing to frame with than a window frame? Looking out over the sunset, you can see the, the trees also framing part of the sky. The, ba the banister, we have a lot of lines there framing out different sections of the, port the photo. On the other hand, this isn't the best photo. A zoom in maybe on the left side only would be stronger than this whole view, but it's still an interesting element. Okay, I mentioned about the focus on the, the little girl at the campsite. This is limiting focus, meaning one approach to achieving the simplification within a photograph is to use a wide aperture when shooting to limit the depth of field. That means things that are closer to the camera are going to be in focus while everything farther away from the subject will be out of focus, or vice versa. Things that are farther away will be in focus and things close will be out of focus. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool for bringing the attention or drawing the eye of a viewer to an element within a photograph. Here we have a photo uh, where the shells are clearly in focus and the water is out of focus, where our eye is drawn to the shells. Same thing, the, now this time the depth of field, it's a little little looser, so it's not as blurry in the background, but it's still out of focus compared to our foreground. This next picture, um, we have motion causing the blur probably more than anything. It looks like he was running, um, but he's in focus, even though around him is out of focus and everything else in the picture is out of focus, but it really draws our attention to him. Symmetry. If you've paid attention, I've talked about symmetry before. I'm a big fan of it. I like things to have a balance, um, and that's a big part of symmetry. Uh, the rule of odds suggests that an odd number of subjects in an image is more interesting than an even number. Thus, if you have more than one subject in your picture, the suggestion is to choose an arrangement with at least three subjects um, and appear in an even number of subjects produces symmetries of the image. All right, continuing with symmetry. Note the arrangement of our three uh, focal points here, even though the one a little farther away from the camera is starting to go out of focus. Note our triangle images here. We have one in the top and then one on the bottom of either side, kind of creating uh, an interesting design to the eye. All right, let's talk viewpoint. The position of the camera uh, can strongly influence the way something looks or the beauty of a picture. Um, sometimes standing in one place and taking a picture will get uh, one view of an object, but just by moving the camera sometimes to the left or the right or to the other side might make for a more interesting picture. It's one of the beauties of using digital photography over the old analog where you were limited on how many pictures you were willing to take. Try them from different angles. Um, usually uh, in film we use a rule of 30 degrees. Um, changing our position of the camera by 30 degrees is noticeable. So try moving your, yourself around the subject by about 30 degrees, uh, increments of 30 degrees. So you start in one spot, move 30 degrees to the right and take another picture. Move 30 degrees from that spot to the left um, and you're back where you started. So move another 30 degrees to the left, uh, 60 degrees, and now take a picture. You have a different angle. Try to find the viewpoint that gives you the best picture. Um, it's a big part of photography. I'm going to let you finish reading that and we'll move on to looking. All right, so here we have a picture. Now, while I don't have the opposing viewpoint or a reverse angle or another change, imagine if we'd gone to the left anymore. We wouldn't really have a good view of something. We might lose the rocks on the right because of we're too close to the rock on the left, or we might completely lose the rock to the left and focus only on the rock to the right. Um, note the palm tree in the back that's covered up by that rock. If we had moved a little to the left, we might be able to open up so we can see that palm tree, creating a kind of interesting vanishing point in the background. It's always interesting to try different perspectives when you take a picture because you never know. There's an old expression you see in movies and TV show where, make sure you get my good side. And this is what it's talking about. Find the good side of any subject that you're taking. Note the position here. Now, it's not always just left and right. Sometimes it's up and down. Imagine if this camera had been up 
higher. Like if the teacher had taken this picture, she's clearly much taller than the rest of the kids. We would barely see anything. We wouldn't have the books. Um, we would have a lot of empty space at the top of our image. But by getting down low and shooting through the shoulders of these uh, different students, we get a lot of intrigue, a lot of stuff going on, but still very interesting. Um, the camera appears to have mainly focused on the kid dead center in the picture between the two shoulders. Um, he's the only one looking at the camera. Everyone else is busy at work, and he's wondering, what are they doing? Got in close, eye level, straight on, and we see all of these smiling faces. Here we're down low. Somebody's kneeling and looking up at something. It's a great shot. Standing behind uh, the dad. We could have gone to the side, but you wouldn't see the cute, the cute smile on the kid's face, nor the kind of crazy smile of the uh, waving arm Uncle Sam we have there. Again, pictures down low. If we'd stood up here and taken it straight shot, the T-Rex wouldn't be so intimidating. We wouldn't have the perspective that we have. It's a much more intriguing shot. Here we're looking down on our subject. Again, changing the viewpoint can change the image completely. So I like to take multiples of any picture I take, three or four different positions before I change the way my subject's standing. I move, not my subject. But remember, if you're taking pictures of a person, you can tell your subject to move too. If you like the angle of the background that you have, ask the subject to turn. Trying to find the right viewpoint is one of the biggest parts of being a photographer. Where are you going to get the best lights? Which side is the shadow falling on? If you want a lot of shadow, then you want the light to one side. It's all about just feeling it out. There's really not a specific answer to any image. It's what are you looking for? What message are you trying to convey? Do you want them to look mysterious or do you want them to look happy or having a great time? Just don't stand in one spot and take 30 of the same picture. It's not going to change very much. Let's talk about curved lines in photography. Curved lines are often used to create a sense of flow within a photo uh, photograph. The eye generally scans these lines with ease and enjoyment as it follows throughout the image. Um, compared to straight lines, which we'll talk about soon, uh, curves provide a greater dynamic influence in a photograph. Alright, so let's take a look at some pictures that have curved lines in them. So we have like S curves, or curved lines are generally used to create a sense of uh, flow, like we said. Notice how it kind of flows through the back of the picture and vanishes. That's generally what happens with lines, is you get vanishing points. It goes as far as it can possibly go until you can no longer see it anymore. Here we have some curvy lines going down the beach as in the rocks and also within the waves. Here we have a curve in the riverbed. Notice how it goes down in the middle. We have the breaking of the water where it falls off. Um, it's just an appealing looking image. It's not flat. It gives it some depth and some texture. All right, straight lines. Horizontal, vertical, and angled lines all contribute to creating different moods of a photograph. It can create a feeling of motion, a speed, quickness, all sorts of things. Um, they are also strongly influenced by tone, color, and repetition. And I'll let you finish reading that yourself. Let's take a look at some pictures, though. All right, so here we have a train. Look for a second, see if you see the lines. You should look at the train. Now, they're not always going to be blatantly obvious lines, but there's a line in terms of how things are laid out. The angle of the photo makes a big difference to the visibility of the lines. Had this person stood uh, with the train directly in front of them, the lines may not be noticeable. But because of the angle of the photo, you have a vanishing point going off with the train. Look here. The tracks and the top of the train all go to that vanishing point way out in the distance. Note the dragonfly that starts to create a line, um, the line and the leaf, all are playing a factor in the image and the feel of the image. Now this line is not as obvious. There's a line of absence where the two children are, are touching. We have a line of division. It's not an actual line this time, but it's just it's created by the space between the two. All right, this one's a little more obvious. We have obvious lines here. We have the the up and down angled lines of the cello or bass or whatever that is. I don't really know, but there you go. It leads the eye. It helps us to follow through with things, and in this case, it's pointing to our subject.
Notice the it's kind of like his fingers are connected there. And they lead down past the, the jawline of the other child. And we also have an S-curve line here between their heads being made. Every photograph contains lines, except for ones that are, you know, just a solid color. Both physical lines and continuous, less obvious lines exist. Um, the brain often unconsciously reads near continuous lines between different elements and subjects in varying distances. Strong flowing lines can be created without a photographer even realizing it. Movement is also a source of a line. Blur can also create a reaction. Subject lines, which create an illusion, contribute to both mood and by means of linear perspective gives the illusion of depth of field. And oblique and angular lines gives the sense of dynamic balance and a sense of action lines and can also direct attention toward the main subject of the photograph. Or continue to the photographs organizing, organizing by dividing it into two compartments. All right, here's a list of some books. If you're really interested in photography, we're going to get in more in-depth with photography as we go, and we'll start to look at and analyze photos. Um, photography is one of my favorite styles of art, and if you love film, then you love photography, because film is just a series of still pictures linked together. Some references, and that will be the end, guys. Have a good day.